Today, we will take a look at Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and Hinduism perspectives in psychology. Religion plays a role in the development of man's psychological perspective. Koinizad and colleagues state that spiritual beliefs can help people with mental health, management of feelings and behaviors, and also to find the meaning of life. There are many religious tenets that contribute to how man perceives his internal and external world, with some of the major religions originating from India, specifically Hinduism, Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism. First, let's talk about Hinduism. Hinduism is one of the oldest religions in India that can be traced to around 1500 BCE. According to the Vedas, man has four goals in life. Artha, which is defined as a pursuit of material goals such as security and abundance. Kama, the fulfillment of the desires of the senses. Dharma, which is doing the right thing and finding ways on how we can fulfill the true calling of our soul and do our duty. And moksha, which is the ultimate goal of Hindus and happens when a person is liberated from samsara and is a perfected ability to live in the present moment, to experience absolute peace and awakening of pure compassion towards God. There are several paths to liberation or moksha, which are bhakti yoga, Yana Yoga, and Raj Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is a path of deep and belief and devotion to God. Yana Yoga is a path of true knowledge, which requires the studies of the text. And Raj Yoga is training the mind to meditate using exercises of the body, breath, and mind. Raj Yoga is also known as the Ashtanga Yoga, which is discussed by Sage Patanjali, and includes eight limbs of yoga toward the attainment of moksha. First, we go to the yamas. Yamas is really the moral code, which includes ahimsa or nonviolence toward self and towards others, satya, which is truthfulness, asteya, which is non stealing. Brahmacharya, which is the right use of energy, and Aparigraha, which is non-greed or non-hoarding. Niyamas, or the personal conduct, include Saucha, or purity, Satosha, or contentment, Svadhyaya, which is self-study, Tapas, or discipline, and Ishvara Pranidhana, or surrender. So this is the second limb of yoga. This includes positive duties or observances, directed towards ourselves and also our actions toward the outside world. The next ones would be the more popular ones that you would encounter, specifically the asanas or the posture, which is um, what is what we have for yoga, um, the, the physical practice, pranayama or concentrating on breath, Pratyahara or sense withdrawal. Dharana or concentration or mindfulness. Dhyana or meditation. And samadhi or union. So these are the eight limbs of yoga. The social caste system, which is part of Hinduism, paved the way for the development of Buddhism as reaction to this former established religion. So Buddhism originated from India 2,500 years ago with Siddhartha Gautama, later called the Buddha. The Buddha was the proponent of the central focus of Buddhism, which is the Four Noble Truths. So the first truth is called the Dukkha, and it teaches that everyone in life is suffering. The second truth talks about the source of suffering, which is desire. The third truth states that there is a way to stop this suffering. And the fourth truth talks about the steps to stop this suffering and achieve enlightenment through the Noble Eightfold Path. So it's the same as the eight limbs of yoga. We have the right view, which is the ability to see things as they are. The right intention or the commitment to improve ethical and mental processes. 
the right speech, which is the use of words that do not harm or slander others. The right action is the responsibility to not harm others and avoidance of sexual misconduct. Right livelihood is attainment of wealth in a righteous way. Right effort is the need for action and balance. Right mindfulness, the ability to be in the present moment. And right concentration is the ability to focus through meditation. These foundations of Buddhism spread in many parts of Asia after the Buddha died and transformed into many different sects with the most prominent branch, Zen Buddhism. So Zen Buddhism flourished in Japan, but actually started in China as Chan Buddhism by an Indian monk named Bodhidharma. Chan is the Chinese term for dhyana, which is one of the eight limbs of yoga that is hinged on meditation. Zen Buddhism is anchored in a three-step process, adjustment of body, adjustment of breathing, and adjustment of the mind. So you'll find a lot of similarities across these three religions and their different perspectives. The common perspectives found in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism now have a growing influence on psychology. And there are several main proponents of these practices who brought them to the West one of them is Dr. Jan Kabat-Zinn, who created mindfulness-based stress reduction or MBSR programs in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and is still currently used today. So MBSR is an eight-week course that basically teaches breathing, relaxation, simple yoga, meditation, and other mindfulness techniques to manage mental health and patients with chronic pain. So the next main proponent of these practices would be Daisetsu Suzuki, who was a Japanese Buddhist scholar who brought Zen Buddhism to the West and spread the teachings of Zazen, which is a sitting meditation aimed to quiet the mind. Our next influencer is Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Zen master, global spiritual leader and peace activist who has authored more than 100 titles covering topics such as mindfulness and meditation. He built dozens of mindfulness practice centers in the West and more than a thousand local mindfulness communities called the Sanghas. And I'd like to share this wonderful quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. And it says, To meditate means to go home to yourself. Then you know how to take care of the things that are happening inside you and you know how to take care of the things that happen around you. Our next proponent is another global leader, Tenzin Gyatso, who is the 14th Dalai Lama and the spiritual leader of Tibet. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 for his nonviolent efforts to liberate Tibet. He also advocates training the mind, and he funded Stanford's research in the neuroscience of meditation, compassion, and altruism. And the Dalai Lama says, all human beings have an innate desire to overcome suffering to find happiness. Training the mind to think differently through meditation is one important way to avoid suffering and be happy. Our next proponent is a psychiatrist, author, and researcher, Bessel van der Kolk. Van der Kolk has been treating patients with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD and other types of trauma for more than four decades. Van der Kolk says, when you slow down your breathing with yoga, you can increase your heart rate variability and that decreases stress. Yoga opens you up to feeling every aspect of your body sensations. It's a gentle, safe way for people to befriend their bodies where the trauma of the past is stored. Our next proponent is Tara Bratch who has a PhD in clinical psychology and is the founder of Insight Meditation Community of Washington, D.C. It is now one of the largest and most dynamic non-residential meditation centers in the United States. Tara worked as a psychotherapist and a meditation teacher, and it came so natural for her to integrate these two powerful practices. This synthesis has evolved in more recent years into Tara's groundbreaking work in training psychotherapists to integrate mindfulness strategies into their clinical work. And the last one that I would be sharing with you today is Deepak Chopra, 
He is an Indian medical doctor and a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He has been at the forefront of the meditation revolution, so Chopra became very popular when he produced numerous materials and mindfulness in meditation and collaborated with prominent personalities in the West to promote meditation, such as Oprah. Several studies show the benefits of these different practices that are hinged to Hinduism, Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism, such as mindfulness, meditation, and yoga, as promising psychological intervention tools. One study points out that Mindfulness meditation-based interventions, or MBI, if properly designed and executed, perform comparably with other established intervention tools that address depression, anxiety, pain, and substance use. Another study talks about an MBSR program benefiting people who are suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. One study also noted that mindfulness-based therapy can be a promising intervention to address anxiety. One of the limbs of yoga, which are the asanas um, shown usually in yoga exercises, have been studied to help improve sleep quality and decrease depression in elders living in facilities. And lastly, one study states that mindfulness and loving kindness meditations are potential tools for a person's mental health and well-being, but points out that further studies need to be rolled out to deepen our understanding of these modalities. So in totality, a lot of these perspectives and practices from the East, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism, we are able to integrate now in different um, intervention tools address, to address uh, mental health, specifically anxiety, for some pain, and these growing um, paradigm may still uh, progress in the future. And it's exciting to see how spirituality can can be uh, dissected and the practices can be taken out of its religious context and can be applied as a specific psychological tool to be able to uh, make it acceptable and accessible to people uh, who may have prejudice against um, these practices just because they are hinged on a specific religion so that is all for my re report i hope that you've gained something in that short and sweet presentation thank you so much for watching and i hope you have a nice day namaste